Regardless, we're doing it. Jeremiah is where we're going tonight, and it's been a couple weeks since we've been in this study of overcomers, but this is actually number eight in the series. Been doing this on Sunday nights. I know we missed a couple, but we'll just hop right in here. Got a few more I'd like to do. And tonight, you get one guess as to who the overcomer is. You get one guess. Say it. You people are afraid to say it out loud. You're whispering it. <laughs> Jeremiah, thank you. I heard a couple of whispers, but you're afraid to say it out loud for fear of being wrong. If you think you're right, then say it. Jeremiah is the overcomer tonight. And while you're turning to Jeremiah chapter 1, I'll just tell you we've been through the sev these seven overcomers. We had Caleb. We had Gideon. We had David. Elijah. Nehemiah. We had a woman. Remember who the woman was? Esther, that was a fun one. And then the last one a couple weeks back was Job. So tonight is Jeremiah. And everybody that we've covered so far had a little different obstacle to overcome. And you'll see that is true with Jeremiah. There's some similarities with some of the others, but I think this one's really unique. And I think this one tonight will be very pertinent to all of us living in the present day where the world does not like Christians, do they? The world specifically does not like Christians who really believe their Bible. <laughs> they seem to have it out for Bible-believing Christians. So that's, uh, that's kind of where we're going tonight, Jeremiah being a great example here. So let's look at Je uh, Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to read the first 10 verses to kick us off, and then we'll get into the message. So Jeremiah 1.1. 1, 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anatoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the king of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Okay, I'm going to keep reading, but get an idea of when Jeremiah prophesied. There's a few kings mentioned there. There's Josiah, king of Judah, Zedekiah, uh, actually, uh, Jehoiakim first. Jehoiakim, Josiah, Zedekiah. And then it says in verse 3, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So this fellow Jeremiah prophesies the last, oh, 40, 50 years of the Jews living in Judah. And why did the Lord kick them out of Judah? He gave them the boot. How come? Help me out. Disobedience, idolatry, yes. The Lord kept warning them, and Jeremiah is the man that God used to warn them about their disobedience and that they would face consequence for disobedience, but they didn't listen. So let's go on here. Verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. So there's a excuse given by Jeremiah. Look what the Lord says. Verse 7, but the Lord said unto me, say not I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Watch verse 8. Be not afraid of what? Now why would anybody be afraid of somebody else's face? People's facial expressions can send darts and spears and knives at you can't they just the way that they look at you and they can be intimidating so he says be not afraid of their faces for i am with thee to deliver thee saith the lord well, verse 9 then the lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the lord said unto me behold i have put my words in thy mouth now verse 10 will tell you about jeremiah's ministry verse 10 see i have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Okay, a couple things about that last verse there, verse 10. Notice the first part says, God set Jeremiah over the nations and over the kingdoms. Does that mean that God's prophets are more important than presidents? Yeah. Sure does. What God said is far more important than what any politician says. Now, 
Notice the words that are describing Jeremiah's ministry here. It says, to root out. Is that positive or negative? That's negative. Root out, negative. I'm going to ask you positive or negative on these. Root out is negative. How about to pull down? Negative. Uh oh. To destroy? Negative. To throw down? Negative. negative. So that's one, two, three, four. Root out, pull down, destroy, throw down. Four negatives. How about the last two? To build? Positive. positive. To plant? Positive. Four against two, negative against positive. A prophet of God. His ministry was primarily negative in nature. Doesn't mean it was all negative. But I know some of you are thinking, man, why is God's prophets and why is God's word oftentimes so negative? Because we need to get God's perspective on us. And since we are sinners, we need to acknowledge that's a negative thing. But nobody likes doing that, do you? I don't like doing it. I, I'm, can I be honest? I don't like saying I was wrong. Do y'all? You're lying if you say you do. You know how spiritual growth takes place? Well, let's back up to that. You know how salvation takes place? The first thing you got to say is, I, nobody else's fault, I am the problem. Let's be more specific and biblical. I am a sinner. That's the first step. Then you understand Jesus Christ died for sinners. Now, now we're getting positive, but you got to start off negative. He died for sinners, and he rose again. But you got to understand that it starts off with you saying, I need salvation because I'm a sinner. I need a Savior because I'm a sinner. The negative first, then the positive. Spiritual growth. How does, how does spiritual growth take place? You have to constantly open this book and say, well, there the Lord called me out again. There I was wrong again. Now you might be thinking to yourself, is it all negative? No, but it begins with the negative before the positive. That's how God starts off things. Negative before positive. Genesis 1, you have darkness first. Then what comes along? Light. God said, let there be light. The negative precedes the positive. Now what's the world want? This is not even in the notes, by the way. This is all free. What's the world want? Positive, 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 positive. We don't want to hear the negative. Positive, 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 positive. But then, okay, I say that. And then in the same, in the same sentence, the world loves positivity. But then what did you have happen here just in the last couple of weeks? The weatherman shows up. And he's negative. There's a storm out there. And it's coming for you. And see, we get all scared about that. And it doesn't even happen. When we ought to take God's word seriously when he's negative about us because he's negative so that we will get right. That's positive when you get right with God, right? You got to start off with the negative. Man, I wasn't even in the, in the notes tonight. So hopefully, you, hopefully there's something there for all of us because I, 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 I need that for myself. Because I, can I be honest with you? I like positive. I like being around positive people. It's more fun to be around people who are positive than they are negative. <laughs> Can I just be honest with you? You still have to deal with negativity when it's true. I'm not saying just be negative all the time because God's always negative because God's not always negative. But if truth be truth and it's negative towards you or me, we need to deal with it. Amen? Okay, just want to start off there. Jer I say all that to tell you Jeremiah's ministry was not easy. You know why? He had to deal with a lot of negativity. He had to tell people they were wrong. And that is never easy. So let's pray before we go any further here. and Let's dive into this thing on Jeremiah. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for just how it just lays things out so very plain and clear. Help us to be ready to deal with things, even if they're negative about us tonight. And may we not walk out of here just steal down in the dumps and negative, but make those things right with you so we can walk out here in the right spirit. I pray that your word would do the work on our hearts tonight that you desire. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so three points as usual tonight. Let's talk about Jeremiah. And let's start off. This will be the fun part. Jeremiah and his prophecies. What kind of a prophet was Jeremiah? I already said a little bit about that, but let's go on. Go to Jeremiah 7. 
I think uh, most of the verses here, if not all, will be in Jeremiah tonight, so that'll make it easy. Jeremiah 7, I think they're mostly in order too. Jeremiah 7, I'm just going to read some of the verses that Jeremiah, some of the things that Jeremiah preached as reading some of these verses, and I'll just stop on a couple of these and we'll talk about them. So go to Jeremiah 7, 17. Jeremiah 7, verse 17. He, he says here, seest not... Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to, to who? The, 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 the what? Who is that? Who's the queen of heaven? Well, it's got to be Mary, right? There's a church in Orlando called, help me out with this one, Zane, I believe it's Mary Queen of the Universe Church, right? Yeah. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. Folks, what you see there in verse 18 is actually no new thing under the sun, and it's actually still around today. Look what it says there. Make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. So long story short, when you see that queen of heaven reference in your Bible, you see it a few times. Uh, another time over in Jeremiah 44, uh, that is actually, if we had to make it modern day, that's connected with modern day Catholicism. And it's not true worship, it's idolatry. So Jeremiah preached against the false religions of the day. Look what else here, verse 9. This is, he's talking for the Lord here. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the, look at this, to the confusion of their own faces. You know where false gods and idolatry leads a person? Confusion. You don't understand anything about our world that we live in. You don't understand anything about the one true God. It's confusion. So then look at verse 20, and you'll get a dose of Jeremiah's negativity here. But it's what God told him to say. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast, and upon the trees of the field, and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and shall not be quenched. Wow, you see the negativity there? Why is he so negative? Because God wanted the Israelites to deal with their sin, because if they didn't deal with their sin, God would step in and bring judgment. And that's ultimately what happened. But God calling to remembrance their sin, the purpose of that was God wanted them to confess their sins and get right with him. That's why this continually comes up. But the more that they said no to God, the more negative messages Jeremiah would preach saying, get right with God. Get rid of your idols and get right with God. Okay, so go over to same chapter. Go to Jeremiah 7, 29. Look at this one. Jeremiah 7, 29. Cut off thine hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away and take up a lamentation on high places. For the Lord hath rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to pollute it. Okay, if you're in Sunday school this morning, what's God's house in the Old Testament? It's the temple. What's it say there in verse 30? They set their, uh, here's something for Sunday school that matches. They set their abominations in his house. Sunday school, we talked about the abomination of desolation. There's probably some kind of connection there with what we see in verse 30. Look at verse 31. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. You know what was going on in Jeremiah's day? Child sacrifice to false gods. That probably is something from a long time ago. It doesn't happen anymore, right? You might want to be careful about doing a little research on that. You'd be probably, uh, you better be ready for what you find. I'll just say that. Child sacrifice to false gods was back in Jeremiah's day, and the Lord called it out because he told them to stop. He told them to get right with him. Okay, go to Jeremiah 22. Now, here's some really interesting stuff. Jeremiah, I'm skipping a lot of Jeremiah's prophecies. First point, Jeremiah's prophecies, there's a whole lot to it, but let's just kind of skip around here. Here's one of Jeremiah's prophecies that really ends up being a problem at first, it seems. But doesn't the Lord always have everything figured out? You read this and you think, oh, the Lord kind of cornered himself with this prophecy. But actually he didn't. 
So you got to really think on this one. This is neat. I know many of you have seen this before, but it's always be worth going back and looking at it again. Look at verse 24. I'm in Jeremiah 22, verse 24. As I live, saith the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee hence. And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. And I will cast thee out, and thy mother that bare thee, into another country where you were not born, and there shall ye die. But to the land whereunto they desire to return, thither shall they not return. Okay, so this man, Kaniah, uh, he's actually also Jeconiah, but the, the J-E was, was removed from his name. J-E being a connection with who? Jehovah. So he loses the J-E, and then look what else. So obviously, this guy is, is a problem. The, the, the Lord is upset with this man. Look at verse 28. Is this man, Kaniah, a, de a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, that's Israelites, and are cast into a land which they know not. Now here's where it gets interesting. 29, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Watch verse 30. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man, what's that next word? Childless. Childless. Now Kaniah is the king of Judah. Who sits on the throne when the king dies? His son. But look what it says here. Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. Now watch this part. For no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Okay, you got to really look at that. See what the Lord just said there through Jeremiah. Jeremiah pronounced that this man, Kaniah, would not have a son. And therefore, since he would not have a son... There would no man of his seed be able to sit on the throne in the kingdom of Judah. Now, hold on a second. It says there, None of his, uh, no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. You know what the Lord did? The Lord cut off any future king over Israel from the, land, from the tribe of Judah, from the line of David. The Lord kind of put himself in a corner. Or did he? I mean, think about this. How is it that there would be a king one day sit on the throne of David and reign if this man is the last king over Israel? Think about Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall, reign up, uh, shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And it says over there that he's from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of David. <coughs> um, Brandon, if you don't mind grabbing grab me a water there, I think I'm going to need it here. How is it that there could be a king reign? By the way, Isaiah 9, 6 says his ever, he will have an everlasting kingdom and reign forever. How is it that that prophecy could be fulfilled? There be a king sit on the throne of David and reign forever. If this man can't have a son... He's not going to have a son, and there will be no lineage of a king. How's that going to happen, folks? Okay, so here's what the Lord did. It looks like the Lord kind of put himself in a corner here with this prophecy. But how was Jesus Christ born, folks? He did not have a human father from the tribe of Judah. Amen? He's born of a virgin. That's a miraculous birth. So when you read that verse, verse 30, it sounds like the Lord kind of put himself in a corner there, made it almost impossible for prophecy to be fulfilled. But folks, if the Lord says something's going to happen, you better believe it's going to happen. Let me get a drink here. Go to Jeremiah 23. It's the next verse, so you don't have to go far. Jeremiah 23. Look at this one. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. 
And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So he, he rails on the pastors and says, hey, I'm going to give you some, some real pastors one day. But then look at verse 5. This is a great, great verse. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto who? David, David a righteous branch, and a, what's the next word? You got a capital K there? And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Isn't that interesting? Just a few verses after, there's no way there's a man from the tribe of Judah, line of David, that can sit on the throne. The Lord says, oh yeah, I'm going to have a, a person, a man from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of David. He's going to sit on the throne. So look at verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved. And Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called. Watch it, all caps. The Lord, our righteousness. There's only one individual in the Bible that qualifies. Who would that be? The Lord Jesus Christ. Who's your righteousness? You got any righteousness of your own? You know what your righteousness and my righteousness is like? Isaiah says, filthy rags. You got any righteousness of your own? You got none. If you are righteous in God's sight, it's because you have the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that something there? So it, it looks like the Lord created a problem for himself, but he didn't. Amen? So that's all there in Jeremiah's prophecy. Now go to chapter 36. A couple more things here. Jeremiah 36. Jeremiah 36. Now you'll see here the people get a little tired of listening to Jeremiah. He's always telling them they need to get right with God, and they grow weary of that. So if you look here, this chapter is really neat here. I'm going to have to skip around. This is a great chapter. I'll skip around a little bit here. Look at verse 1. It came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came into Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel. Notice the negativity here. Against Israel and against Judah. And against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may what? Forgive. Now, isn't that positive? Isn't forgiveness a positive thing? I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Excuse me for a second here. <clears throat> So that's a positive thing, but the negative's got to come first. You've got to acknowledge your sin before you can be forgiven. Look at verse 4. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that came out of their cities, okay? So long story short, Jeremiah speaks. This man Baruch is his scribe and he writes. So this is actually how you got your Bible today. It had to be spoken first, then written, then copied, then translated. But we're just starting with the speaking and the writing here. So I'll tell you what happens in this chapter. Jeremiah speaks, Baruch writes, and the words that he writes eventually makes it to guess who? the king, the king of Judah, who at this point is Jehoiakim. So go to verse 20 and watch what happens here. And they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elisha the scribe and told all the words to the, in the ears of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll and he took it out of Elisha the scribe's chamber and Jehudai read it in the ears of the king and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Okay, so at this point, folks, this is pretty neat. God's words are being read to the king of Judah. That's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if this ever happens, but what a glorious thing it would be if the Bible was opened and read to the president every day. Amen. Wouldn't that be a good thing? So at this point in history, this is pretty neat. The word of God has made it all the way into the king's chamber and they're reading it. Well, let's see what happens next. Verse 22. Now the king sat in the winter, <coughs> excuse me, the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. 
And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, uh-oh, he cut it with a penknife. And what else did he do? Cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Now look at 24. This is interesting. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. Nevertheless, El Nathan and Deliah and Gemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll, but he would not hear them. Folks, what happens when the king hears God's words? He don't like it. He says, cut it up and burn it. Isn't that much of the world's attitude toward the scriptures? Isn't that something? Now, I'll let you read the rest of the chapter, but you know that you can't get rid of God's words. So he tried to destroy God's words. He probably heard that judgment was coming. And he didn't like it. So he thought, if I just get rid of it, I don't have to worry about it. You know, that's how a lot of people think. If I just put that Bible over there, if I just get that Bible out of my house, I don't have to worry about it anymore. How ridiculous is that? God's word is going to come to pass whether you believe it or not, whether you have it in your house or not. God says that it's going to happen. I'll, I'll give you a little preview here. Look at verse 32, end of the chapter. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And there were added besides unto them many like words. Can you get rid of God's words? God said, there is no problem in me giving Jeremiah the words again and Baruch writing them down again. God keeps his word. He's preserved it for a long time, hadn't he? So no matter what man does to it, you can't get rid of it. I think that's kind of neat there. Now, here we go. Go over to Jeremiah 38. We'll get this second point. These last two points will go a little quicker, I promise. Jeremiah 38. The prophecies of Jeremiah. Let's see what's next here. Things are going to get sour here for Jeremiah in this chapter. If you look at verse 1, you see here, Then Shephatiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, and Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword. Don't, don't forget this. We'll come back to this in a minute. He that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, and by the, fam by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life for a prey, and shall live. Thus saith the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore the prince has said unto the king, <laughs> They're, they're talking about Jeremiah here. Watch what they say. We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. For thus, he does what? He weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city, and the hands of all the people, in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. Time, time out a second. Why did Jeremiah tell all these people? If the Chaldeans show up, go with them. Don't stay in the city. What was Jeremiah actually trying to tell them? If you stay in the city, what's going to happen? You're going to die. And they take it as, this man is not seeking good things for us. He's seeking harm for us. Jeremiah was actually telling them how to save their life. And they don't like it because it's not what they wanted to hear. But he's actually telling them the truth. Okay, we're going to verse 5. <coughs> Watch what happens here. Then Zedekiah the king said, behold... He is in your hand, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. Now, now hold, time out on that statement. Hold on a second. Can't the king tell the people anything and they pretty much have to do it? What kind of king is this right here? You know what kind of king it is? He's a lot like modern day politicians. He's afraid of the people. If he doesn't give the people what they want, he's afraid they might rise up against them. So he basically says, y'all do whatever you want with Jeremiah. So look what happens. Verse 6, then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamalek, that was in the court of the prison, and they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Well, what kind of reward do you get for doing what God said? <laughs> hey, this is a message about overcomers. So that had to go wrong for Jeremiah somewhere along the way. It had to get bad for him. So here's point number two. Jeremiah's prison sentence. 
He does what he's supposed to do and ends up in prison. So here's a, here's a place where I need to remind us of something. Do right in the sight of the Lord and keep doing right in the sight of the Lord. Oh, along the way, people aren't going to like it. And keep doing right in the sight of the Lord. Somewhere along the way, it might get worse for you before it gets better. But I promise you, it'll get a whole lot better. So how in the world is Jeremiah going to survive and get out of this pit, this prison that he's been thrown into? Did you notice there, he's in the court of the prison. They let him down with cords. He's in a dungeon. There's no water. And he sinks while he's in the mire. Now, what do you think Jer going through Jeremiah's mind whenever he gets down there in that, in that dungeon? What do you think he's thinking? I have to think, I mean, he's a man just like us. He's, he's, a, he's a human being, just like all of us here. He's probably thinking, what did I get myself into? Was it really worth it to say all those things that God told me to? I mean, look where I ended up. I'm at the bottom of the barrel. I'm as low as low can go. Was it really worth it to do that? Maybe I should have been a farmer. Maybe I should have been a plumber. They had plumbers back then. Maybe I should have just said, Lord, I'm just going to do this other job. I would guess that there's all these thoughts going through Jeremiah's mind, and he is thinking, did I really do what I should have done? Now, what's the answer to this? We wouldn't be reading about him today if he hadn't done all these things. So he did the right thing. But consider at this moment in Jeremiah's life, he probably was about ready to just throw in the towel. So in his prison sentence, look what happens. Verse 7, make sure you take note of the individual who helps Jeremiah here. This is one of the neatest things. Look at verse 7. Now in ebed Melech, the what? You don't want to forget that. The Ethiopian. One of the, one of the what? Can you think of another place in your Bible where there's an Ethiopian eunuch? Isn't that something? We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, when Eben Melech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Ebed Melech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon. And he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. So watch verse 11. So Ebed Melech took the men with him, and went into the house of the king under the treasury, and took thence old cast clouts and old rotten rags, and let them down by cords into the dungeon of Jeremiah. You get this picture? They're tying all these rags together, these old clothes together, and they lower that down there. It's like a rope, but they don't have a rope. This is all they got. And they're going to pull Jeremiah out with that. So look what happens, verse 12. And Eben Melech the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under thine armholes, under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. I don't know how long he was in prison, but who came to the rescue? An Ethiopian. Isn't that neat? You know, the Lord doesn't forget anything. You know that? Many, many years later, I got a date in my Bible of, oh, 595, 594 B.C., Many years later, in fact, a little over 600 years later, when you get to the book of Acts, the first Gentile who gets saved is in Acts chapter 8, and he just happens to be an Ethiopian eunuch. Hey, Genesis 12 says, if you bless the Jews, what happens to you? I think that counts individually or corporately. You bless a Jew, God's going to give a blessing to you. In this case, this Ethiopian man blesses a Jew, Jeremiah, a very important Jew, gets him out, and God didn't forget that because, lo and behold, the first Gentile saved in the book of Acts just happens to be an Ethiopian eunuch. Isn't that neat? See how the Bible is just intertwined? Now, you got to read the Old and New Testament both to get that, but that's pretty neat. So there's Jeremiah's prison sentence. 
Let's go over to Jeremiah 38 here and go to verse 20, uh, 14. Actually, you're there. Look at verse 14. Let's see what happens here. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing. Hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, this is, this is funny right here. He says, if I declare unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? Now, why would Jeremiah say such a thing in verse 15? Well, we've got 37 chapters before this where he keeps prophesying. And how's the response? Nobody wants to hear it. Even the kings don't like it. In fact, he ended up in prison because the king basically gave those people uh, the freedom to put him in prison because they didn't like him. So Jeremiah, that's a good question he asked there. He says, hey, you going to kill me if I tell you the truth? Uh, if I tell you what's really going to happen, what are you going to do with it? So look at verse 16. Look at the response of the king. So Zedekiah the king swears secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death. Neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel. Now watch this statement he tells Zedekiah the king. The word if. If. Thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes. Then thy soul shall what? Shall live. And this city shall not be burned with fire. And thou shalt live in thine house. Okay? If the king wants to live, when the Babylonians show up, he basically surrenders himself and goes with them. That's how he can live. Jeremiah tells it very plain. Look at verse 18. He says, what happens if he doesn't do that? But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes... Then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. Uh, aren't you get glad that the Lord gives you choices? And in this case, the Lord says, do this and live, do this and die. Any sane person would say, I'll do whatever i got to do to live, right? Isn't that what a sane person would do? Well, let's see what happens here. Verse 19, and Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand and they mock me. This guy's kind of a coward. Are you noticing that? This old Zedekiah, he's a rascal. He's a cowardly king. 20, Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord has showed me. And he basically says, you're going to face judgment. So whose word always prevails, folks? God's word always prevails. So we had Jeremiah's prophecies. His prophecies landed him in prison. He gets out of prison. Watch what happens to the nation while Jeremiah prospers. So this last point will be, Jeremiah's prosperity, but let's see what happens to the rest of the kingdom here. The very people he'd been preaching to all these years. Look at verse 1 of chapter 39 here. We'll wrap them up. Jeremiah 39, 1. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in, and sat in the middle gate, even Nergoth Sherezer, Sam Garnebo, Sarsukim, Rabsaris, Nergoth Sherezer, Rabmag, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. And it came to pass that when Zedekiah the king of Judah saw them and all the men of war, what was he supposed to do when he saw them? Surrender. But watch what he does here. When he saw the men of war, then they fled. And went forth out of the city by night, by the way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls, and he went out the way of the plain. What's, Jer what's old Zedekiah trying to do? He is leaving the city, refusing to surrender. He's running for his life. Okay, so if Jeremiah's prophecy be true, what's going to happen to Zedekiah? It's not going to go well for him, right? If he would have just stayed there and surrendered, say, hey, I'm going with y'all. Y'all tell me what to do. I'm going to go with it. He would have lived. Well, let's see what happens here. Verse 5, but the Chaldeans' army pursued after them 
and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath. And what happened to him? What does it say there happened in verse 5? He gave judgment upon him. He would not have faced, we're going to read what happens here, but he would not have faced this if he would have listened to God's man, Jeremiah. He said, do this and live, do this and die. And he said, I didn't obey. He didn't do what he had to do to live. So look at verse 6. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. Also, the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people with fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem. Did you know that old Zedekiah could have avoided all that? He would have avoided all of that trouble if he just would have listened to what the prophet said. Amen? You know how things will go well for me and you? Listen to what God said. Do what God said. God gives us choices. Oftentimes it is do this and be blessed. Do this and land in trouble. And we oftentimes do this and land in trouble and have to learn by experience. Hey, can I tell you a little secret here? You don't have to learn by experience. Learn from the experience of Zedekiah and do what's right and do what God said. So you find out here that Jeremiah, let's keep going here. Let's see what happens to Jeremiah. We got to get this last part here. It says there, uh, I think we left off verse 9. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon the remnant of the people that remained in the city, and those that fell away that fell to him with the rest of the people that remain. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left of the poor of the people, which had nothing in the land of Judah, and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Now watch, here's Jeremiah here. Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him... And do what? Look well to him. And do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. Who gets off with freedom here? God's man. You know why he gets off with freedom while all these others are carried into captivity? Because God takes care of his men and his women. Amen? God takes care of his people. Look what it says here. It says verse 14. Or 13, rather. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent, and Neb Nebuchadnezzar, Rapsuris, and Nergal Sharezer, Rab Mag, and all the king of Babylon's princes, even they sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison and committed, an, committed him unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home so he dwelt among the people. And then it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison saying, and he, and he tells him basically uh, uh, some things that set, tell Ebed Melech, actually had got him out of the prison there. And God, you can read the rest of this your own, but God spared Jeremiah, and who did not get spared? All those people Jeremiah had been preaching to who didn't want to listen to him. Here's the thrust of the message here, folks. It always rewards. God always rewards you if you obey him. Amen. It is always worth it to obey God. So I'll give you this. Today, if parents are going to look for a name for their kid, they're going to choose Zedekiah or Jeremiah? Jeremiah. Jeremy, Jeremiah, that's a biblical name called Jeremy in the New Testament. Jeremiah. And the reason why is Jeremiah is a man that you want to be like, a person that you want to be like. So here's what I'll leave you with. Jeremiah was a true overcomer, and I'll give you three reasons why. Number one, he spoke the words God commanded him to speak. He just obeyed God and spoke, even though it wasn't popular, he spoke the words God told him to speak. Number two, he obeyed the commands God gave him. He spoke the truth, he obeyed God's commands, and then here's number three, and this is where it gets kind of tricky sometimes, but Jeremiah is a great example. In spite of all the people around him doing the opposite, Jeremiah remained steadfast in his commitment to the Lord. 
Speak what God said. Speak the truth. Obey what God said. Be steadfast in your commitment to the Lord. The only way that you and I will be overcomers the way that Jeremiah was is if we are not ashamed of God's words, not ashamed to do right in the sight of God, and then keep on doing right. By the way, is it getting easier or harder to do right? I, I think it's getting harder. And there's more opposition by the day, it seems like. It's getting harder and harder. But let's go to the New Testament and wrap up here. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. I do have one New Testament verse here. I didn't, didn't remember that. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Last verse in the chapter. Good little reminder for us. This lines up with all the things pertaining to Jeremiah that we said. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. This is how you overcome. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren... Be ye steadfast, unmovable. What's the word after unmovable? Always. Not sometimes, always. Abounding in the work of the Lord. Now watch this part. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Does the Lord reward those who labor for him? Oh, yeah. It's always worth it. It's always rewarding to do work for the Lord. So be an overcomer like Jeremiah. When the world's against you, keep doing right. When the world is even more against you, keep on doing right. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because it's always worth it to do what God said. So let's pray together. Sure, want to thank you, Lord, for just giving us uh, truth again, giving us great encouragement. I know this world is just really bearing down upon us. This world is not like Jesus Christ. This, Lord, this world is against your word. And I pray that we would learn from the example of Jeremiah and follow in his footsteps and just continue to do right no matter the opposition. I pray that in the week ahead, there might be some of us here in this room that face some real serious opposition when it comes to just doing the right thing. Help us to be faithful to you. We ask for the strength and the, uh, just the ability and the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to do right and fight against the wrong. And we ask this in Jesus' name.